Greetings to all of you. My dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, a warm welcome to all of you from your pastor, Yeti. So since yesterday, I started again the daily broadcasting, except there will be no one on the Sundays. We started a new meditation, a study about prayer. And in our second chapter, we are in going in view from above. To climb a 14,000 foot mountain in Colorado, you need an early start, as in four o'clock in the morning early. But you need to limit coffee intake in order to avoid dehydration. You drive on chases, slapping, rooted roads in the dark, always alert for wildlife, gaining elevation to somewhere between the 9,000 9, and the 10,000 feet where the hiking trail begins. Then you begin to hike by wending your way through a forest of blue spruce, lodge pool pine, and Douglas fir, and trail that feels spongy underfoot from falling needles. The ground gives off a pungent smell of decay and earth. You walk beside a tumbling creek, silvery white in the pre-dawn moonlight. It's burbling the only sound until the birds awake. Around 11,000 feet the trees tine, giving way to lush meadows carpet in wildflowers. The sun is rising now, first casting a reddish alpen glow in the mountain tops, then dropping its rays into the basin. Bright clumps of lupin, fireweed, columbine and Indian paintbrush dapple the open space while plants with more exotic names monk's hood, elephant head, bishop's cap, scheming bell or chiming bell I think it's the word marsh marigold cluster near the water edge you follow the creek of the basin skirting cliff bands until a climber trail veers off to zigzag up to the grassy shoulder of the peak you have chosen to climb. By now, your heart is racing like a sprinter's, and despite the morning chill, you feel sweat under your backpack. You take a water break, then head up the steep trail, forcing yourself to get it out. The dawn chor chorus of birds has begun and you are startling by a flash of indigo, bright as neon, as a flock of western bluebirds suddenly catches the sun's rays. Looking back over your route, you feel accomplished. You'll make the summit, you feel certain. Down below you see something, a tiny dot just as the edge of the timberline. No, two dots. Animals are merely rocks. One spot moves, can't be a rock. A marmot. Size is so hard to judge up there. And the second dot looks red. Could they be hikers? You glance skyward, searching for signs of the thunderstorms that roll in before noon. If they are hikers, they're flirting with dancers, starting their climbs at least three hours late. You watch the ant crawl progress as the tiny Dutch edge up the trail. Then it hits you from this vantage point. Three hours ago, you too were a dot like that. A speck of human life on a huge, hulking, weather-creating mountain that has little regard for it.
you feel appropriately small, almost insignificant. You get a tiny, fractional glimpse of what God must see all the time. One of the Psalms describes the thunder as the voice of the Lord, who strikes the earth with flashes of lightning. And we know, of course, that lightning occurs when a positively charged streamer rushes up from the ground to meet a negative charge at the bottom of a cloud. A hundred times a second lightning strikes somewhere on earth, and for one do not believe God personally programs each course. view from below. I'm going to tell you a story again from the author. And he says, I have had hints of another vantage point that even dwarfs the scale of mountains. One night in 1997, I drove to a lake near my home to watch a lunar eclipse. And to the east, hanging just over the mountain peaks, the hale Bob comet, like the sky brighter from than any star. To judge its size, I held my two fists at arm's length, barely covering its luminous streaming tail. Then I gazed through binoculars at this object that had traveled the bread of the solar system. In another corner of the sky, the crescent shadow of Earth began crossing the moon, dimming it to an unnatural orange huge, marched closer to Earth than it had been in centuries glowed red above the moon. As the glimpses progressed, all the stars in the sky brightened as if on a rheostat. The Milky Way spilled across the expanse directly above, a broad river of diamond dust. I stood gazing so long that my craned neck grew stiff, and I left only as clouds gathered and snow began to fall, blotting out the celestial view. I felt appropriately small that night too. To appreciate the scale, consider that if the Milky Way galaxy were the size of the entire continent of North America, our solar system would fit in a coffee cup. And even now, two Voyager spacecrafts are hurtling toward the edge of the solar system at a rate of 1,000 miles per hour. For almost three decades, they have been speeding away from Earth, approaching a distance of nine billion miles. To send a light speed message to the edge of that universe will take 15 billion years. And when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? Ask the psalmist. An excellent question as well as a reminder of a point of view I easily forget. We are, we humans, a mere pinch of dust scattered across the surface of a non-described planet. All the earth of all reality is God, an unimaginable source of both power and love. In the face of such reality, we can grovel in humanoid humility, or we can, like the psalmist, look up instead of down to conclude, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And to explore the mystery of prayer, I begin here, recalling the vantage I get from the summit of a mountain looking down or from an 
observatory looking up. Each provides a mirror silver, sliver I mean, of a glimpses of reality as God must see it, like a flash of lightning. Prayer exposes for a nanosecond what I would prefer to ignore, my own true state of fragile dependence. The undone task accumulate at home families and every other relation temptations health plans for the future all these i bring into the larger reality god's fur where i find them curiously unpended prayer helps correct myopia a calling to mind a perspective i daily forget i keep reversing roles thinking of ways in which god should serve me rather than vice versa as god fiercely reminded job the lord of the universe has many things to manage and in the midst of my self-pity i would do well to contemplate for a moment god's own point of view the peace of wild things when despair grows in me and I wake in the middle of the night, at least sound in fear of what my life and my children lives may be, lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great harem feeds. I come into the peace of wild things. We do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light for a time I rest in the grace of the world and I'm free prayer rises my sight beyond the pity or as in Job's, Job's case dire circumstances of daily life to afford a glimpse of that lofty perspective i realize my tiny less in god's fastness and the true relationship of the two in god's presence i feel small because i am small when after scrudging aside all the caustic theological queries god enlightened hapless job the poor man crumbled I'm sorry, Job said, in effect. I had no idea what I was asking. Job, Job did not receive a single answer to his probing questions, a fact that no longer seemed to matter. Who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? God asked. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Kicking and screaming all the way, I am still learning the lessons of Job. God needs no reminding of the nature of reality, but I do. The third rock from the sun or planet has spun off its theological axis. There was a time, Genesis informs us, when God and Adam walked together in the garden and conversed as friends. Nothing seems more natural for Adam than to commune with the one who had made him, who gave him creative work, who granted his desire for a companion with the lovely gift of Eve. Then prayer was a natural as conversation with a colleague or a lover. At the moment of the fall, for Adam and for all who succeed him, God's presence grew more remote, easier to doubt, and even deny. Every day my vision clouds over so that I perceive nothing but a world of matter, 
It requires a daily act of will to remember what Paul told the sophisticated crowd in Athens. God is not far from each one of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. For this reason, prayer may seem strange, even embarrassing. How odd that prayer seems foolish to some people who base their lives on media, trends, superstition, instinct, hormones, social property, or even astrology. For most of us, much of the time, prayer brings no certain confirmation who have been heard. We pray in faith that our words somehow cross a bridge between visible and invisible words. Penetrating a reality of which we have no proof, we enter God's milieu, the realm of spirit, which seems much less real to us than it did to Adam. join the stream. It occurs to me, thinking about prayer, that most of the time I get the direction wrong. I start downstream with my own concerns and bring them to God. I inform God as if God did not already know. I plead with God as if hoping to change God's mind and overcome divine reluctance. Instead, I should start upstream where the flow begins. When I shift direction, I realize that God already cares about my concerns. More than I do, grace like water descends to the lowest part. Streams of mercy flow. I begin with God, who bears primarily responsibility for what happens on earth, and ask what part I can play in God's work on earth. Let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream, cried the prophet. Will this new starting point for prayer, my perceptions change. I look at nature and see not only white flowers and golden aspen trees, but the signature of a grand artist. I look at human beings and see not only a poor bare fork animal, but a person of eternal destiny made in God's image. Thanksgiving and praise surge up as a natural response, not an obligation. I need to correct a vision of prayer because all day long I will lose sight of God's perspective. Prayer and only prayer restores my vision to one that more resembles God's. I awake from blindness to see that wealth lurks as a terrible danger, not a goal worth striving for. That value depends not on race or status, but on the image of God every person bears. That no amount of effort to improve physical beauty has much relevance for the world beyond. A habit of attention, be still and know that I am God. I read in this familiar, familiar verse from Psalms two commands of equal importance. First, I must be still, something that modern life conspires against. Mystery, awareness of another world, 
an emphasis on being rather doing thing than doing, even if your moments of quiet do not come naturally. In this hectic, buzzing world, I must carve out time and allow God to nourish my inner life. A habit of attention, be still in that focus. All else comes into the focus in that riff in my routine. The universe falls into alignment. Stillness prepares me for the second command. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Along through prayer, and I believe that truth in the midst of a world that colludes to suppress, not exalt God. Psalm 2 depicts God laughing in the heavens, scoffing at the kings and rulers, arrayed in revolt. God is indeed exalted among the nations. I think of Paul singing in Philippians jail and of Jesus correcting Pilate with the plain truth. You would have no power over me if it is were not given to you from above. Even of that moment of crisis, Jesus had the long view, the view from a time antedating the solar system. Be still and know that I am God. The Latin imperative for be still is vacate. God invites us to take a holiday, a vacation to stop being God for a while and let him be God. God is inviting us to take a break, to play truant. We can stop doing all those important things we have to do in our capacity as God and leave it to Him to be God. Prayer allows me to admit my failures, my weaknesses and limitations to one who responds to human vulnerability with infinite mercy. To let God be God of course, means climbing down from my own executive chair of control. I must in uncreate the world I have so carefully fashioned to further my ends and advance my cause. For us to pray can be that a challenge and a channel. We live an, on a broken planet, falling far from God's original intent. It takes effort to remember who we are, God's creation and fate to imagine what we someday will be, God's triumph. Why pray? You can ask that question almost every day in your Christian life, especially when God's presence seems far away and when you wonder if prayer is a pious form of talking to yourself. Our conclusion will unfold only gradually but I begin here because prayer has become for me much more than a shopping list of requests to present to God. It has become a realignment of everything, a prayer to restore the truth of the universe, to gain a glimpse of the world and of me through the eyes of God. In prayer, I shift my point of view away from my own selfishness. I climb above the timberline and look down at the speck that is myself, 
I gaze at the stars and recall what role I or any of us play in the universe beyond comprehension. Prayer is the act of seeing reality from God's point of view. Let's pray. Amazing God, almighty, graceful God, we thank you for this experience that we could listen to the words and they can be useful to us. And I pray that everyone who is listening to this broadcasting will take some food from this experience in education and meditation of prayer. Open our eyes and ears that it comes to our heart, Holy Spirit, so that we become more to the understanding that it is not about us, but that it is about Christ, your life. Help us to become instruments in this perspective that we will feel more and more the need to pray, not as a guilt or a must-do, or not a to-do list or a shopping list, but as a relationship with you, as for the connection we have with our brothers and sisters, but also for those who are outside who don't even want to know about you, Lord. But you, as our Creator, we worship you and give you all the honor and glory. Amen. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye.